Welcome everyone to the Damage Report. A Thursday, a fantastic Thursday. Here with you, Francesca Fiorentini. That's me in for John Idarola. Of course, I think I said his name right. Uh, I forgot how to say his name. It's been so long. No, um, and with me, uh, another another F name that I'm very, very fond of, Mr. Farron Cousins of Ring of Fire. How are you, Farron? I am doing great. It's such a such a fun day of fun stories to talk about. So much fun, <laughs> fun, fun, fun till the daddy takes the Fox News away. I don't know. Well, if you get that reference, <clears throat> excuse me, good for you as I hack up a lung. Yeah, we're gonna get into it. Uh, we're gonna talk about actually former Fox hosts trying to make themselves relevant. We're going to talk about um, soon to be Fox News hosts as in GOP presidential hopefuls who absolutely will not become president. Um, we're gonna talk about Fox just owning itself. There's a lot of Fox coverage, but also some Barbie stuff. Um, there is a new trend after the Barbie movie. Um, guess what it is? Buying more Barbies, but we'll talk about exactly how. Obviously, the shutdown news that we are two days out from it. And then Biden trying to clap back at the GOP. So uh, lots to cover, a lot, very pretty heavy, but very good. So while you're here, don't act brand new. You know what to do on a Thursday, okay? You're liking the stream. You're subscribing. If you haven't already subscribed, what's wrong with you? You're sharing it right now and obviously sending in your super chats, your comments over on Twitch, and I'll be reading them in our social breaks. Um, but with all that, Farron, are you ready to dig in? Let's do it. All right, let's go. Well, the second GOP debate aired last night on Fox News, and, um, you know, again, sort of a sad display of runners up. People who probably won't make it and probably won't even be chosen as Donald Trump's running mate again. The front runner by a long shot in the GOP presidential primary. There was, however, a ton of crosstalk, a lot of bickering, and for the first time, actually, some criticism of the former president himself. So we'll get into that. Again, because Fox News is incredibly litigious because they need money because they are also being litigated. We can't show you any clips from it, but we can do our best Chris Christie <laughs> and Ramaswamy impressions and Nikki Haley impressions, and we'll talk about some of the major takeaways. Uh, but first, just so we all know what kind of we're dealing with here, here is recent polling of who is ahead in the primary. Um, Donald Trump by 54%. And trailed by DeSantis, and look at that downward line. I mean, it's just, it looks like the difference between like unionization in America and like CEO pay, you know, <laughs> that same sort of like split, you know, it, which is a sad thing to compare it to, but uh, not when you're talking about DeSantis. So DeSantis' star is falling. Ramaswamy's star is starting to, <laughs> and everyone else is kind of duking it out there uh, in the bottom, sort of two and a half to five percent over there, or two and a half to, yeah, yeah, point six percent as Hutchinson's there. But anyway, Donald Trump was obviously not at the debate, um, not again. And so this time the Republican candidates thought that it was a good time to call him out on that. Um, Ron DeSantis said, Donald Trump is missing in action. He should be on this stage tonight. He owes it to you to defend his record where they added $7.8 trillion to the debt. That set the stage for the inflation that we have now. Is that a good sort of like whiny little bitch <laughs> impression? <laughs> um, <laughs> he then went after a, a Trump on his abortion views, which is actually kind of interesting. He said the former president who's missing in action has a lot to say about that. He should be explaining in his com, she should be here explaining his comments to try and say pro life protections are somehow a terrible thing. I want him to look into the eyes and tell people who have been fighting this fight for a long time. Yeah. But Trump's actually acknowledging what the majority of Americans believe, which is that overturning Roe v. Wade is kind of a terrible thing. And, and Trump is actually being a bit honest about it because he's terrible uh, at lying about this issue like the rest of, like someone like Ron DeSantis who continues to lie about this issue and how it's a small fringe that wants abortion bans, that wants Roe v. Wade overturned. But anyway, uh, before we uh, before I kick it to you, one more, maybe the line of the night, Farron. Uh, was Chris Christie, which apparently he was very combative, uh, clearly all night trying to stake his claim out there. The only person uh, who says that he, well, he says he would still endorse Donald Trump, but that Trump did lose the election and he shouldn't have uh, tried to not certify the votes um, and that Mike Pence did the right thing. But so here's Chris Christie, he looks right into the camera and he says, 
Donald, I know you're watching. You can't help yourself. You're not here tonight because you're afraid to be on this stage and defending your record. You're gonna keep doing that. Nobody up here is gonna keep calling you Donald Trump. We're gonna call you Donald Duck. And then he dabbed, this is real, he dabbed on stage. No, he didn't, but he should have because that might have stuck the landing a bit better. Now, Farron, I get what he's trying to do. He's trying to call him Donald Duck, as in you're ducking the debates. But I think you need to, as a comic, yes, not a massively successful one, but I understand how the joke structure is written. You've got to at least set that up. Otherwise, when you say Donald Duck, I'm thinking Disney immediately. <laughs> you got to say, if you keep ducking the debates, we're not going to call you Donald Trump, we're calling you Donald Duck. Like, and that's, that's how we, like, if you wanted to land that mediocre joke, you land the mediocre joke, but thoughts about like them actually naming the elephant in the room this time. Uh, you know, actually, when Christy said Donald Duck, you could see DeSantis like kind of have like PTSD flashbacks there because <laughs> uh, of his fights with Disney. But uh, in all seriousness, DeSantis actually did come out like in the first few minutes. And you could tell he was definitely coached better mm. than he was prior to the first debate because he came out, he had some fire. He was like, I'm gonna go after Donald Trump. And then that tank hit empty about five minutes in. <laughs> he he went so many long stretches of time where he just he didn't even speak. So whatever they told him right before he went on, he was like, Yeah, okay, totally. I got it. I'm gonna do it. But he didn't keep it up. And and this really, for DeSantis, this was his make or break it moment. I mean, the yeah. first one was make it or break it. He didn't make it. So this is, all right, man, you got one more shot. Can you do it? And the answer was no. I mean, you know, yeah. Ramaswamy uh, came out, was, was the loudest on stage by far, obviously, had uh, the always. tallest <laughs> hair. And so <laughs> he dominated that stage. And Chris Christie, you know, for all of his trying, yes, I, I'm sure he spent forever coming up with that one liner there. But all he's able to do is talk about Trump. And mm -hmm. it's like, cool, dude, that's kind of like our job to, to call him out and make fun of him. Um, you're supposed to actually be talking about policy. We get it, man. Trump is terrible, the worst there is, but you have to come with something better. And he's a one trick pony. And I'm shocked he's even still in this race, to be honest with you. So that's my big takeaway is Ramaswamy dominated, DeSantis fizzled quickly, and Chris Christie, boy, it's just getting tiresome to listen to him talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's just stick on the who won and who lost before we get in obviously the real issues. But I do want to just jump down because uh, uh, it seems like voters agreed with your assessment. Um, let's jump down to graphic 11. This is from the Daily Mail, always got a caveat, but hey, they've got their finger on the Republican pulse. Uh, who is the winner of the second debate? Donald Trump number one. <laughs> so <laughs> the Donald Duck line didn't take him down. Um, but again, he's the front runner. Vivek Ramaswamy, 26% said, 17% uh, DeSantis, and then Nikki Haley, six, Mike Penn, six, Tim Scott, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Chris Christie, 3%. Um, five, I mean, you know, when you get beat out by I don't know who won, that's rough. That's, you know, can it be a ranked choice? Can we do that? Um, but also, uh, voters in Iowa, again, uh, the first primary state, also gave their thoughts. Uh, this is what they said to CNN about who won. Who you think did best during this debate? All of you. Bergam. Won. Christie. Okay, so his toughness didn't appeal to anybody tonight. DeSantis. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Haley. One, two, three, four, five, six. Pence. Ramaswamy. One. Scott. All right, so it looks like DeSantis, the winner. Okay, so maybe DeSantis coming out swinging a bit on Trump uh, worked on these Iowa voters. You saw nobody raise their hand for Pence. In fact, there was a little bit of a chuckle there. One guy for Burgum. I love that one dude. Um, again, this is all just randomized and unimportant, but somehow given our voting process, important that we care about these same Iowa voters we just sort of roll out of a closet. Um, not a lot for Ramaswamy, but a lot for uh, DeSantis and then Nikki Haley actually, whose line of the night was to Ramaswamy and they've been going at it for a while, was something like, every time I hear you, I feel dumber, which 
I gotta say, like, not trying to girl boss to Nikki, but I like that line. It's like better than a Donald Duck line. Remember that this was at a time when the day actually that Donald Trump visited Michigan to visit auto manufacturers working at an auto parts plant who were not in a union. That's right, this was not in a UAW factory. This was a non union plant that he went to actually disparaging unions. And that was unlike, I mean, that was, sorry, not unlike the people on the stage at the GOP debate. So this is what. Uh, candidates said about that. Uh, Tim Scott said Joe Biden should not be on the picket line. He should be on the southern border. Again, remembering that Joe Biden just visited um, Detroit and stood on the picket line with UAW workers. He should be on the southern border working to close our southern border. Yeah, with his body. Um, uh, Senator Tim Scott, who did not disavow his earlier remarks that took a harsh line against those striking workers. And then, um, Vice President Pence said that he would fight for the right of workers to decide whether or not to join unions. Joe Biden doesn't belong on a picket line, he belongs on the unemployment line. What? Is that a line? Was that a line you just rehearsed on the line? Does that mean he's out of a job or does that mean his unemployment numbers are so bad? Because unemployment is actually down. Like jobs were more jobs were added to the economy this year than expected. So, but I don't know, Farron, let me kick it to you because I'm so interested in the way that this faux populism is now being completely imploded by the UAW strike among the GOP. And here you see they are not even sort of lending. I mean, Vice President Pence saying, yeah, I support a worker to decide whether they want to join union. That's anti-union speak right there. That's right to work BS right there. But what do you make of this? It, it, it is really funny to watch all of these people up there. I mean, apparently the best the Republican Party has to offer and every one of them immediately pivoted away from the issue. I mean, nobody could actually address it. They're like, uh, unemployment, uh, southern border. Uh, maybe I don't know if they can or can't, and because they don't know. These are people who have never stood up for American workers. They have mm-hmm. never sided with American workers. Never passed legislation for American workers. I mean, I could go on forever, but these are people who understand that part of Trump's appeal. Uh, if if that's a thing, but yeah. to America is the fact that he can sound, even with his golden toilets and opulent castles, he can sound sometimes like he cares about these people, uh-huh. but they can't even pretend. And that's why they have to pivot. That's why they're deflecting because this is new territory for them. And uh-huh. it's gonna be an issue obviously next year, especially with Trump who's gonna be the nominee. Because this resurgent union movement throughout this country, that's going to play a big role in next year's election. And I think it's one that people, even with the UAW strike, even with the culinary worker strike that could be coming up in Las mm. Vegas, mm. Um, you know, these workers are active, these workers are angry. You know, the the Hollywood strike, another huge example. So unions will play a big role. And if these Republicans can't even pretend, to care about what these workers need, then that's gonna be electoral doom for them next year. I know, and and I really hope that Biden capitalizes on, you know, basically what he's been doing. And I hope he makes promises around and really sees we gotta overturn the filibuster, but sees to it that we pass the PRO Act um, and pass that through the Senate. But but it is huge. Like these are the ways that he can hit against them. These are the, this is his angle. You know, yes, it was performative to go to the picket line, but also he openly stood with the UAW and he openly said, look, record profits means record contracts. And that's his sort of line, line, line. And again, it's almost like they would rather talk about Medicare and Medicaid than this because they have a better line, which is still a terrible line around whether they want to cut those social benefits for Americans as well, which is deeply unpopular. They're deeply unpopular people. Can we remember that? <laughs> and I think as Farron pointed out, 
The only thing that Trump had was again and has is a faux working class veneer, ironic as that might seem, but it is very much that celebrity cultivated, I get you. You know, anyone who is that successful on television has that ability to make you think that they're your friend, right? Obviously, look at me, very successful here on YouTube. No, but but so and all of these GOP candidates, I mean, they seethe elitism, they drip privilege. They are so out of touch with the average American people, and it's so obvious. Um, but of course, they're trying to deflect just a few more uh, things in terms of what they what they went to. Obviously, we gotta we gotta stop woke, which means you know uh, mm-hmm. making sure transgender people die effectively. Uh, so Vivek Ramaswamy and Mike Pence pledged for a national ban on gender affirming care, because they all have to one up each other. Um, And also requiring that schools out uh, children who might be trans. Ramaswamy proclaimed transgenderism in kids a mental health disorder. The very people who say that this increases the risk of suicide are also the ones saying the parents don't have the right to know about that increased, increased risk of suicide. What? He said, adding, to affirm a kid's confusion, that's not compassion, that's cruelty. That's cool, bro. That's also your opinion. Stats say that's absolutely not true. And that the more you can embrace a kid and their identity, the less they will want to harm themselves. So anyway, whatever you have to tell yourself at night. Pence, of course, um, uh, said that he would, uh, basically he's like, I'm, I'm fine with the LGBTQ plus community, but they're violent. Um, and <laughs> so he said, I'll stand up for the safety and civil liberties of every American from every background. He said before pivoting to affirm his support for rules requiring schools to effectively out transgender and non-gender conforming kids to their parents. Linmar Community Schools in Iowa had a policy that you had to have a permission slip from your parents to get a Tylenol, but you could get a gender transition plan without notifying your parents. That's crazy. We're gonna stand up for the rights of parents. I apologize, he didn't say that they are violent, but they are more likely to be victims of violence. But he's saying parental rights, which is just so wild to me, Farron, that this is a party that claims to care about kids. And then ultimately it's like, oh no, no, we care about parents. Not teachers, just parents, because parents are the only ones who know, except for the parents who support their trans kids and their transition or their identities. And we don't we don't support those parents or those families. Just the parents that these, it reminds me of the scene in, um, I'm gonna just now quote the jerk, uh, the scene of like when he's giving the prizes, any prize, any prize, except for you know, everything between the teddy bear and the gumballs, anything between, all right, but like lower than the zebra. <laughs> like, it's, like we support these parents. These are the parents GOP uh, supports. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, I, they're not going to stop this either because they think it's a winning issue. You know, we 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 see it obviously down here in Florida. It's it's horrific, but we had this week Republicans come out with a budget proposal that would kick one million single mothers with children off of the federal SNAP yeah. benefit program. So. They can talk all they want about wanting to protect kids and oh, we're gonna take care of the parents and we're gonna listen. You're literally more concerned about what's in the kids' pants than what's in the kids' belly. Mm. You know, Fetterman out here this week putting forth legislation like free school breakfast and lunches. That's taking care of children because again, making sure that these kids are actually taken care of, that they have nutrition, that they have, you know, the basic necessities. To be able to live is important. These culture war BS issues that Republicans are pushing every day means nothing other than trying to already marginalize this group that's already so marginalized in society just because they need somebody to beat up on so they can be like, no, 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 parents, the problems in your life are all coming from this group. It's been that way my entire life. You know, yeah. Reagan, when he burst out, he was president when I was born. You know, his whole thing was the welfare queens. You know, right. your life sucks because these people are mooching off welfare. Then it's just constantly evolved. With Trump, it was the immigrants. Your life sucks because of these people. Yep. There's always the others. Mm-hmm. You know, your life is bad, not because. You know, the corporations you're working for are screwing you over. No, 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 no. 
it's these people over here that are making your life so bad. And Which they, is so ironic yeah. because this is the party of personal responsibility, right? If you yeah. want to have an abortion, <laughs> uh, suddenly we don't believe in liberty, we believe in personal responsibility. Yeah, uh, but yes, when it comes to why the economy is the way that it is, or why communities are the way that they are, it's not you know corporate greed. It is this other this or your own personal responsibility. Is this other person over here? Yeah, it, they just deflect, um, and they, and it's wild, and they're going to keep doing it, and they kept doing it with the border, right? So again, the new line now, it's not enough to build a wall. Is we have to send troops into Mexico. That's what we're doing. Um, and then we're going farther. So Nikki Haley proposed defunding sanctuary cities, adding 25,000 more border patrol and ICE agents, which by the way, is the largest enforcement agency, is the largest federal agency in this country. You guys, you need to know how big border patrol is. It's massive. So like, it's so massive. There are people in border patrol in their cars just playing Candy Crush. People still play that? Playing, I don't know. They're they're swiping on Tinder. They're just there. So I just want you guys to know, like that all means nothing. It means absolutely nothing to add more border patrol. Um, implementing a catch and deport policy instead of instead of a catch and release policy. She suggested no money should go to addressing root causes of migration until the border is secure. Good, good on you, babe. No, that's great. Yeah, definitely don't stop <laughs> uh, the don't stop setting the fire. Just try to keep putting the fire out. That'll that'll work. Great. Uh, Ramaswamy said he agreed with his fellow Republicans, but he's going even further. This is fun. And he's supporting the end of birthright citizenship for the children of undocumented immigrants. He's also advocating for militarizing the southern border while DeSantis is supporting using the military to go after Mexican drug cartels, blah, blah, blah. Something that DeSantis says about all this. Again, one upping one another, completely uh, evading the actual uh, source of the issue, which is the failed war on drugs, if that's what you're talking about. I did want to note one thing, Farron, before we have to break the thing that you were mentioning, and I remembered my thought. If they really wanted to hammer Biden on any of this, they could, but they would have to do it from the left. If you want to talk <laughs> about protecting children, you could talk about taking away uh, the child tax credit program, right? And the fact that that lifted however many millions of children out of poverty, and now we're back to child poverty rates that we had before the pandemic. Um, and they can't, because then they would have to admit that they also didn't vote for it, that they didn't like it, that no Republican voted for the American Rescue Plan. Um, and, you know, that would be that. But they can't do that. So, I mean, it's like, again, and same with the border stuff. I mean, Biden is continuing the Trump legacy on the border. It's one of the issues. Unions, all hats off to him, but immigration policy, he's doing terribly. They could hit him on that, but they agree with him too much. So they just have to one up it. You know, um, the, the Republicans are not going to be happy till we have every like border patrol and homeland security agent on the border, like a big game of Red Rover, linked yeah. hands, like, nope, nobody's getting through here. We got goal line defense. We're not going to, and it's, it's, it's ridiculous because the, the issue of immigration will never be solved the way Republicans want it to because the same people funding their campaigns are the people benefiting from all of these people coming across the border. That is cheap, exploitable labor. Yes. And they keep it open so they can get it. They give the money to Republicans who use it as a talking point to get reelected, and the cycle continues itself over and over again. There's been another massive legal blow to Donald Trump and the Trump Organization this time, um, dealt by New York Supreme Court Judge Justice Arthur Engeron, um, who ruled that the former president and his company, yeah, they committed fraud by inflating their assets, i.e. lying about that in order to score more business deals, more loans, etc. Um, this again is part of uh, Attorney General New of New York Letitia James's lawsuit against the Trump Organization, and this is this is huge. This is basic. This is it. Uh, the New York judge found Donald Trump and his adult sons liable. Again, notice Ivanka has has escaped from this, uh, liable for fraud and canceled the Trump Organization's business certificate. 
A shocking ruling that poses an existential threat to the former president's financial empire as he runs for a second term in the White House. Judge Arthur Engeron's ruling on Monday is a complete rejection of Trump's arguments that he didn't inflate the values of his golf courses, hotels, homes at Mar-a-Lago and Seven Springs on financial statements. And that ruling is in response to Letitia James's $250 million lawsuit. That's that's what she's seeking in damages for the state of New York, a ban on the Trumps from serving as officers of a business in New York. That's okay, there's always Florida. And to stop the company from engaging in business transactions for five years. A trial is expected to begin next week, people, on the amount of damages owed and the full breadth of Engeron's ruling and how it will play out still remains unclear. We're obviously gonna cover that trial next week, but this is huge. This is um, this is massive to the point where Engeron has said that they will be discussing how to manage the dissolution of these corporate entities. Um, he said this that the or sorry the questions still remain as to how the receiver would dissolve those properties if the ruling would impact properties located outside of New York State, including Mar-a-Lago, and if the Trumps could transfer the New York-based assets into a new company located out of state. He better slow his roll against DeSantis because he's going to need that governor <laughs> and all of the powerful folks over there in Florida. Um, it is unclear, but to give you a sense, we're going to obviously keep reporting this next week, but to give you a sense of the severity of it, this this was a question that Trump's defense attorney, Christopher Kiss, asked the judge. He said, certain of the entities, um, Certain of the entities own physical assets like 40 Wall Street and Trump Tower. Are those assets now going to be sold or managed under direction of the monitor? Um, so they're not talking about did they win this lawsuit or not? They've failed, they've lost this lawsuit. The question is how much money and how are these assets gonna be dissolved and which assets do they apply to? Oh My God, Farron, this is huge. <laughs> I love how the lawyer is just like so. Is like, do you are you are you gonna sell, are, do you sell this? Like, what what do we what do we do? I don't know. Like, no, you're the lawyer. You should 100 percent know what is happening, even if the judge hasn't been crystal clear with you. And of course, I think what a lot of people didn't understand about this ruling on Tuesday, because a lot of people thought like, oh, okay, it's done. Like, no, 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 no. All that was determined was that he's guilty. He's yeah. still going to trial and Letitia James, by the way, is pushing to make sure the trial does not get canceled because Trump's lawyers are already like, well, we should just not do it. But Letitia James wants to present her evidence. Mm. She wants it to be heard and she wants it to be out there for everyone to see. That is the whole big point of this. It's not just getting the additional instruction from Engeron. It's James being like, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. I got some things here that I think everybody needs to be aware of. So we're gonna we're gonna do this. We're gonna go through the motions, and y'all are gonna see firsthand how bad this fraud was. And that's honestly what scares Trump the most about this. Like he doesn't necessarily care about paying 250 million. I know he loves money, he doesn't want to lose a dollar, but the biggest blow to him with this case is the egotistical blow. Yeah. This is going to prove that he is not worth as much as he says he is. He sued people in the past for saying he's not worth as much as he has claimed. Yeah. Like that's how much it bothers him. So James is going to go through and make sure that everybody knows this guy is full of it and I've got the receipts to back that up. And that can still go forward. The trial is still going forward. And I'm sorry if I misrepresented this um, because it, it's just like my mind is, you know, discombobulated with all of these cases. But the trial can still go forward even if the judge has already ruled that you, yeah, you got to like dismantle these uh, organizations. Yeah, is that, yeah. Is that your understanding of it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the judge will have to go through and fully explain what it means. But it will also give the Trump lawyers the opportunity, even though they don't seem to know that they have the opportunity, uh, they can argue against it. And the judge may say, okay, these entities here, these can stay, these cannot. So it's not as final. Mm -hmm. As it it seems on paper, there is the opportunity, although I don't think they will be successful. I think it will be the full everything has to go sale. But 
it's 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 going to kind of is going to be very technical once it gets down to that part and it's going to be a lot of things that are you know I don't even understand either but the big thing is just James getting the opportunity to show the world like here's all the evidence yes look what I did so that'll be the fun part then the other part's going to be ticky tack accounting and you know all of that stuff. Sure, right, right, right. And like what what you can can I can I still do cameos? I feel like <laughs> John Trump Jr is going to want to know. Is that legal but out of New York if I'm in Mar-a-Lago? Right, but so next week we're going to really see that full accounting. We're going to see the breadth of of fraud in terms of what they lied about, what they actually had. You know, I'm reminded of the time that Ivanka Trump, I believe, gave an interview and I forgot which media outlet, but she said something about her dad, you know, pointing to a, a homeless person and saying, uh, this guy has more money than me. Effectively saying, like, I'm in the red so bad. <laughs> like, we are. <laughs> this is probably one of, after one of the many bankruptcies. Um, but of course, he bounced back because, you know, rich people with famous last names do. <music> Trump is having a real hard time uh, coping with the news that his financial organization might be dismantled. As we now know in Letitia James's case against him in New York, um, that the judges ruled, uh, yeah, he is going to have to, the Trump organization did the fraud. So we'll find out more about that. But Trump himself is going ape on uh, Truth Social. He's bleeding the statement on truth. 45th president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Now a lot of blah, 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 blah. But number one, I am worth much more than the numbers show on my financial statements. Yeah, we know, we know that you're worth like less and or more. Like you keep lying about it. That's why you you lie to get the, you lie that you're that you're over what you're worth in order to get new business dealings. And you lie to say you're under what you're worth to avoid paying taxes. We know you lie. I love that Farron in the first thing he's saying, I'm worth much more than what the financial disclosure. It's like, stop admitting to doing crimes. <laughs> like, yeah, that's a, that's tax fraud, buddy. Yeah. Uh, that's the whole thing that Alvin Bragg was originally, you know, investigating you for, but for some reason he dropped that and went after the Stormy Daniels stuff. Uh, but you know what? And even just saying that right now, it actually put it back in my memory, like, oh yeah. We actually had the criminal investigation into Trump uh, back mm -hmm. when uh, Cy Vance was in charge. They were at the point, uh, according to uh, Pomerantz, that's right. We had we had the indictments written and ready to go. And Bragg said, "Nah, I'm not going to do that." So yeah. Trump is lucky that he's only going to have to pay money and lose his businesses because it would have been you pay money, you lose your business. And you go to jail for this. Right, another criminal indictment um, and more facing more jail time. But of course, this that doesn't really bother him, it seems. And I thought we thought this was a really good uh, little quote from CNN. Uh, Jamie Gangle, uh, who is, uh, I, I believe, a legal analyst for CNN, explained why maybe this case is is hurting Donald Trump just sort of emotionally, physically, spiritually more than maybe some of the criminal indictments. Take a look. This is triggering Donald Trump like nothing else. Yeah, we it, see the reaction on, on Truth Social. It, it goes to the heart of what he cares about, which is his image, his brand, the notion that he's the best. Michael Cohen, his former lo lawyer, uh, once told me, I think it was last year, the way to get to, as he calls him, Donald, is not these criminal cases. That's not what's going to bother him. It's going to be going after property, business, money. Property, business, money, that will bother him. But of course, will it actually bother the base? They later discuss and we can talk about it right here. But let's just review other other times he's been convicted of financial fraud. Remember Trump University? Yeah, sorry for those of you who have your diplomas, $25 million settlement. That's what Trump University had to pay to students who say they were duped. They never met Donald Trump. They only got to take a picture with a cardboard cutout of him. We remember how this went. <laughs> or remember when the campaign tricked their donors into giving more money? Check this box if you don't want to also continue to not donating every single month. <laughs> um, online donors were guided into weekly recurring contributions, demands for refunds spiked. Remember that? Um, or what about? Bannon and the build the wall pack or whatever the hell that was <laughs> and the other people. Um, 
Trump sentences or judge sentences Trump allies in the We Build the Wall scheme. Andrew Badalto, Badolato. Oh, I like that name. Uh, sorry, Andrew was sentenced to three years in prison. Brian Colfag for four years and three months after being accused of channeling donors' contributions into their own pockets. Bannon, meanwhile, was on a yacht. But so this won't really matter. But it does. Look, Farron, if he doesn't get reelected president. Which, I mean, the stakes could not be higher for this guy. Um, He needs some kind of financial entity to keep making money, especially when if he loses, ain't gonna be a third. Like, we're not going back. (laughs) Like, there's no more Trump pack or recount the. I mean, there's, oh God, I just got sick thinking of. You realize that if he loses again, that we're gonna do the entire they stole the election thing? Again, I think I need to lie down. <laughs> I think I need to lie down. You guys, you guys, it, am I the only one that this just first dawned on that not only do we have to deal with him running, but we have to deal with the two years or four years of him saying that he actually won? Uh, I, I hadn't thought of that either. That's actually very. Very depressing. So, you know, we'll we'll <laughs> we'll carry on for the rest of the show, I guess, here. But I mean, geez, wow, that's a punch to the gut. Um no, he I, I don't know what he does because you know, I'm I'm not necessarily buying into the polls that show that he's like totally clobbering Biden. Like mm. that just doesn't seem Mm-mm. possible, uh, given the other election results we've seen in the last year. So I I, I don't buy into that a hundred percent, but like, what does he do to make money? Is he just like he could start a YouTube channel? I mean, he hasn't been good with social media. I mean, true socials, you know, half dead as it is, but right. maybe he becomes a streamer. I, you know, I mean, he's got <laughs> enough people to, that would watch him. I mean, he could have success with that and, you know, be victim to the algorithms like the rest of us, but his brand outside of him personally. Yeah. Nobody's going to trust it. The banks are not going to want to loan money to an organization that was just found guilty of fraud. Uh, we, we've already seen it overseas where other countries are starting to be like, ah, we don't we don't want you to come here. I mean, so unless he can strike a deal and build Trump Tower Pyongyang, then I don't know what he's going to do. Oh, damn. He did, he did talk about how much he loved the real estate in North Korea. <laughs> so there, that's always an option, I guess. That's going to happen. That is absolutely going to happen. You know what else is going to happen when AOC is president? All of Trump's former properties will be socialized and open to the public, and we'll all get to hang in the different pools and golf courses. <laughs> we'll give Ivana a proper burial at Mar-a-Lago. This is this is the future. This is the revolution I want, people. You guys all remember when Sri Lanka rose up not not so long ago. People swimming in the presidential palace. Let's go. You if the Senate's plan a non starter in the House, I don't see the support in the House. There you have. I don't see the support. Dad, Senate Democrats want to keep the government open and staring down again, two days, 48 hours from a government shutdown. The leader of the House, whose job arguably is keep the government open, maybe. <laughs> Maybe first, you know, second might be like, you know, proficient in Microsoft Excel. I'm not sure he's either of those things, but there's McCarthy saying no, he won't be able to get his House Republicans, many of whom have really hate him and hate his guts as evidenced by 15 rounds of voting for his speakership. Um, he said that he won't bring it up for a vote, even though it was passed by Senate, uh, by the Senate. He says, um, or at least Senate Democrats, Representative Bob Good told reporters after a closed door House GOP conference meeting that McCarthy informed lawmakers during the gathering that he will not bring the upper chamber's legislation to the floor for a vote, even after the Senate voted to advance it in a bipartisan fashion Tuesday night. So yes, sorry, both bipartisan. Pressed on if McCarthy told the conference that he will not bring up the Senate legislation, Good responded, that's exactly right. So cool, so not going anywhere. Um, What are the things um, that uh, they are holding out on? Um, And what are the things that were included in this resolution? Well, the continuing resolution included um, things like uh, uh, 6.15 billion to fund 
to in funding for Ukraine, uh, 5.9 billion in disaster assistance that would temporarily extend the expiring authority of the Federal Aviation Administration. You know, when it comes to flying planes, um, the FAA and funding it might be a little important, but that's okay. Kevin McCarthy and the uh, Freedom Caucus in the House would rather not. Let's not do that at all. Let's just shut the entire government down. So that that was what it was included in this continuing resolution coming from the Senate that McCarthy is says he's not going to do. In fact, McCarthy is saying that he wants to talk to Biden. I want to talk to the manager. He wants House Speaker Kevin McCarthy reportedly wants to meet with President Joe Biden and parent bid to renegotiate their months old budget deal as McCarthy desperately <laughs> seeks to appease House Republican hardliners who are demanding radical spending cuts and avert a government shutdown as soon as October 1st. However, someone like AOC is saying what we're all thinking, which is, didn't we just do this? So she tweeted, uh, McCarthy already got his meeting with Biden and they struck a deal. To keep the government open months ago, the GOP held the entire US government hostage in exchange for cuts and forced restart of student loan repayments. Deal is done, Biden held his end, nothing to litigate, McCarthy can go pound sand, which is amazing. (laughs) And then she said this, which I guess is a a part of the girl math meme, but she turned it on its head and said, boy math is needing 15 attempts to count the votes correctly to become speaker and then shutting down the government nine months later. I mean. Just fire, fire, uh, like shots, shots fired. You know what I'm saying? My brain started to break halfway through this show. <laughs> but the point is, and you've seen AOC also report that they're calling these meetings at midnight. These votes are happening in the dead of night. Like Republicans are trying anything they can, and we'll get into what they're trying to do to hold up voting to fund the government. But Farron, like, what are we doing? <laughs> and does Kevin McCarthy know what he's doing? You know, if they're having to do votes at midnight, doesn't that kind of cut into, you know, the events that uh, Madison Cawthorn said that Republicans mm. like to do? Like, when are, the, when are they going to have time for the fun oh God, if you're having so to vote all night? Um, look, I, I, I see this obviously as Kevin McCarthy put himself between like he intentionally wedges himself between the rock and a hard place. And then he's like, <laughs> oh my God, how have I ended up here? And at this point, I almost want to ask McCarthy, be like, look, I know you're going to shut down the government to appease the hardliners or else they're going to vote you out of the speakership. But I have to ask you, Kevin, why do you want to stay the speaker? Mm-hmm. Like you've done nothing but embarrass yourself. Yes, you have the title, but You've gained nothing from this. Like you're not improving your status. You've you've diminished the office itself. So why like at this point I'd be like, "You know what, guys, screw it. Take the job. I'm going to go back to being like a regular person and I'll just yeah. show up at committees and go to my parties later." I mean, why are you doing this to yourself intentionally? To appease Matt Gates and and yeah. Marjorie Taylor Green. Green came out this week and and specifically said if republican any republican who tries to pass these bills to avert a shutdown she said quote i will fight you and i don't know if she means like i'll fight the legislation or if she's literally going to get down there and start throwing fists but they want a shutdown they think somehow it benefits them trump called for them to shut down the government over the weekend said don't worry just do it blame it on biden and so we've got the the dumbest people you could ever pick like yep. if you had ai write a you know quick description of what the dumbest person in the country would look like he would come up with a republican house member that's mm-hmm. what would happen mm-hmm. and that's not what we legal got. in the new wga deal however <laughs> that have to be a non union writing job for ai yes um <laughs> But no, that you're exactly right. I mean, and this is what happens again when they reach their goal of being in government. They realize their entire point of being there is to undo the function and workings of government, right? And it's perfect when they have to also in their bucket of crabs 
way choose a leader and they can't choose one because they don't know where they're headed. They don't have a vision and they don't have a goal, right? And if the leader isn't a strong man enough, i.e. Kevin McCarthy definitely not able to impose his will or command respect, then what little fascists do is they just fight each other. They don't actually know how to fall in line. They don't know how to work together. Um, so again, it, it, they don't know what they're doing. They literally don't know what they're doing. But they definitely know they're going to continue to be completely insane and ridiculous, not just threatening to fight people, but also just defunding the military and slipping in amendments like the following. Um, Marjorie Greene um, used the Holman rule to attach an amendment to a short term defense bill to reduce Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin's yearly salary to a dollar. Austin is the first African American Secretary of Defense and, and she said was destroying our military and had allowed recruitment to fall to crisis levels. Here she is explaining what she's doing. I urge the House to adopt my amendment, Madam Chair, to take Secretary Lloyd Austin's salary using the Holman Rule, which is a rule that allows us to fire failures that are serving our government and serving our country. Lloyd Austin is not serving the United States military. Lloyd Austin is leading it into failure. How, what, why, what are you doing? So this is the kind of outlandish stuff that they are pulling and that like at this late date and it's like nothing, this is not gonna pass. This is not going to pass. But of course, Lauren Boebert, uh, jealous of her fellow mean girl, had to get in on the fun. And uh, she tries, although there's a little bit of a, there's, there's, she basically, she fails. She tries and fails to do the exact same thing using the Holman rule, except her, her iPad isn't loading fast enough. Take a look. Um, it decreases the salary of the deputy, uh, deputy under secretary of the food and nutrition services. And um, Madam Chair, I would like to reserve for the time being. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Colorado. Madam Chair, one moment. My apologies, I do not have amendment number 77 in front of me. Um, but Madam Chair, I do urge adoption of amendment 77 to be um, considered to decrease the salary of um, the deputy secretary. Yes, the deputy, deputy secretary. Oh man, oh Bober, just just hit on the vape girl, hit that vape, it'll all come clear to you. Um, and yeah, it's as dumb as she is, she got her amendment into uh, the bill to reduce the annual salary for assistant secretary for defense of defense for readiness, Sean Skelly. Who's transgender? Oh, fun. To a dollar in a transphobic rant, she accused Skelly of espousing wokeism that had caused significant harm to our military readiness and troops morale. So she had to, that was a slip up. You didn't see the good part where she started, you know, sort of bashing a, an official in the Secretary of Defense for being trans. So this is what we're playing, Farron. And like, they're so unserious. They are deeply unserious people. Yeah, uh, give me give me a minute here, uh, Francesca. <laughs> as, um, the 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 deputable bleeping <laughs> blah blah blue. Um, no, I mean, my God, it's the Ralph Wiggum like me fail English. That's impossible. <laughs> I can't believe we have these people in Congress, and I can't believe that they have the nerve to criticize the way John Fetterman dresses when Green is showing up there wearing an area rug over her shoulders that looks like it came out of a teen girl's room from the 90s. Mm. This is pathetic. But seriously though, the 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 bigotry obviously that that's no joking matter. Like it is yeah. very clear what these individuals are doing. It's clear why they are attacking these specific members of the government and it, it's it's sickening. And as we talked about earlier in the program, this is what they do now. If they can yeah. find anybody that doesn't look like them. So we're talking about anybody that's not 100% crystal clear white person, mm -hmm. we're gonna come after you. If you happen to be a member of the LGBTQ community, we're coming after you. We're gonna make you the reason 
why everything else is so bad. You know, you want to talk about military recruitment. How about we go back to the George W. Bush years when he's launching his illegal wars? Military recruitment got so bad, they had to lower the standards to be able to take people with criminal records, people who didn't finish high school, people with affiliations to hate groups. That's what happened back then. And we didn't, oh, let's reduce their salary down to a dollar. People no, and they loved it. Yeah, and, and, and then they attacked the Capitol. All the <laughs> radicalization came home. They, you know, brutalized and tortured people abroad, and then, you know, years later they attacked the Capitol building, set them up, and knock them down. Exactly. Um, Farron, sorry to interrupt, but we are out of time. There is more, however, in the aftermath, you guys. But if you're on linear. This is where we say goodbye. Thank you so much for tuning into the damage report. There is much, much more. Don't go anywhere. Hold on to your butts. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.